Did you see that coming? What a powerful second half. I'm Roger and this is Bookshook and today's podcast is all about the second half of An Island by Karen Jennings, published in 2021. So the idea of the podcast is that we'll spend a month reading a book, hopefully together. I'll split the book into two equal halves. On the second Friday of the month, I'll share my thoughts and yours on the first half of the book, maybe make a few predictions. And when we finish reading the book, I'll publish part two of the podcast in a similar vein. That'll be on the last Friday of the month. We'll decide whether it's a book we'd recommend to a friend or not. Of course, you don't have to read anything at all. If you're into Audible, then you can listen to the book. Or you can do neither, of course, and just join me for the ride. I'll be summarising what happens in the book just for you, but be aware there may be spoilers. You can leave a comment or start a conversation at the Bookshook YouTube channel or send an email to bookshook at yahoo.com. Maybe you have thoughts you want to express about the book that I've missed or there's something in the podcast you agree with or really disagree with. I'd love to share your experiences in the next episode. Welcome to Bookshook. So this podcast is all about the second half of an island from 50%. I'm reading this on a Kindle this month, which is slightly unusual for me. I'm used to reading traditional paper books. Anyway, I'm reading from the chapter beginning Samuel Rose from the Couch, and that's 50% on my Kindle. So Samuel's interrogators tell him that his father is dead. And because Samuel is a rebel of the state, the father won't be allowed a proper burial. (laughs) Samuel reflects that owing to his time in prison, his child in his mind, this is Leslie, is still a baby and his sister, a teenager. We learn the reason that he is in prison. And he says, quote, I know that I have no idea what my child looks like. In my mind, he's still a baby. He's still a tiny little baby that I last saw in the arms of my mother on the morning that I went to the march on the square. So he was protesting. Samuel remembers dog who's a street child friend is recruited into the dictator's army and wears very smart boots and samuel says quote you think she's turned a dog into a person you'll be a dog all your life samuel remembers leaving prison and seeing his sister but there's still no information about maria or leslie the sister is really horrible and so are the two children he finds out that his son leslie died a few years ago and Mary Martha who's the name of his sister is not at all sympathetic she quote helps him get the job at the lighthouse and he says quote soon Mary Martha came home with a newspaper clipping advertising the job at the lighthouse I'll help you get it she said but then I never want to hear from you again why is she so horrible to him what is the reason The man makes a gesture towards Samuel. So we're back at the lighthouse now. He points outside and gestures that someone may be murdered. He marks his neck with his finger. And then we go on to the third day. Samuel contemplates murdering the man and he remembers his proactivity in helping to overthrow the colonists. Quote, shame did not come immediately, not for chasing the friends of his father out of their home, even as they begged him not to, not for smashing their baskets and leaving their beaded creatures lying around as though the products of a dreadful slaughter. He describes how he meets Maria at a shabin, which is like a pub, and she clearly has very strong views. Quote, our enemies, Maria was saying, are the political profiteers, the men who swindle and cheat, who take bribes. They are the people who are little more than ministers of waste, who spend money on making themselves look big, on making the country look big to those overseas, caring nothing that people are starving. What we need is a new order. Those that take bribes and embezzle and are corrupt in any way must be killed. They must be publicly executed. They must be eradicated. That and nothing else is the purpose of the people people's faction. Our purpose is to kill. Samuel remembers being humiliated by a soldier and Maria sees it and thinks he's a coward. Quote, afterwards walking with them, he remembered it well, that walk. It was late evening, the streets heavy with traffic, stalls beginning to be packed away before curfew. A soldier had stepped out of a doorway, looking back as he took his leave of someone, not seeing where he was going. He had collided with Samuel. Watch yourself, boy, he had said. Then, don't you apologise, boy. Don't you beg my pardon. I'm sorry, sir, he said. Damn right you are, boy. The man moved on, rubbing his hands up and down his shirt front and sleeves, as though to remove Samuel from them. The others walked on, but Maria waited for Samuel. He felt himself blush and took a moment to choose a swear word he could use to describe the man, almost reaching out a hand to take hers. But then she said... Oh, yes, suit. I see it now. You're a real tough one. You fight for what you believe in. 
Samuel desperately tries to get revenge on this sergeant, but he never does. And then we go back to the present on the island, and he points an imaginary gun at the man. Quote, Samuel looked down at where the man lay on the couch. He aimed and shot again, remembering the urge to humiliate someone, to smash their face in, to make them cower. And then we get another flashback to where Maria comes to Samuel saying she is pregnant. She says, quote, it's yours, although it's implied that it's probably another man's baby. When he says he'll look after her and the baby, she says to him, quote, a man like you would take another man's baby and want to marry a woman who can't stand him. She is a very harsh woman. His family are against him going to the faction meetings while they are desperately trying to earn enough money to put food on the table. And his sister says, quote, I'm sure it must be very interesting spending your days talking about how you're going to save the world while the rest of us try to earn enough money so that we can buy food to feed you. And his sister does become interested in this character, Dog, who's the homeless boy with the new independence government, and he has a nice job, remember, with these smart shoes. Leslie is born, and Juma, who's another member of the faction that Maria and Samuel are in, says that a body has been found. And Big Row from the faction has been found dead. They bury him under garbage in the dead of night so that they aren't discovered by the new independent government. And then we go back to the present. Samuel finds a body in the cove with a slit throat. He worries that the man may have done this and may now want to murder him. So he thinks about hiding in the cove. Quote, he bent a little and looked at the woman's face. Her hair was braided close to her scalp. Her ears stuck out slightly. She had similar cheekbones to the man, the same narrow jaw and wide mouth. Had they both come from the boat that he had seen on Winston's phone? They must have done. But why would a drowning man take the time to slit a woman's throat? Perhaps that was what he had come into Samuel's room to say the previous night. It had not been a threat, it had been a confession. He had killed a woman and had fled. He was not a refugee at all, he was a fugitive. No wonder he hadn't wanted to be taken into the mainland. What might the man do if he discovered that Samuel had the body? He was a murderer. Already he wanted Samuel gone. Already he had trapped him. Already he had tripped him, had begun to take over the cottage. He might do anything else, anything, if he knew about the body. But to bury the woman would take time, time that Samuel did not have. Not if the man had risen, if he was in fact out on the island searching for Samuel. Now at this point in the story, it's getting mega tense and mega exciting, I've written in the margin. He buries her in an old disused hut that the man won't be able to find and he reflects how he has been an undertaker at two funerals now, for Big Row and now for this lady. And he contemplates, quote, what he could have done about either of them and he mouths the answer, violence, oh dear. He remembers with his faction being told that they must become violent. There's a ceremony where they say the words, quote, the land is mine, I am the land. And he repeats those words in the hut next to the woman as he licks some soil. So he's going to fight for his island. He's going to kill the man. This is going to end really badly, I'm thinking. I believe as a reader, this poor man is innocent. He's a refugee. Or have I been tricked? Maybe he is a fugitive. Samuel sees the man searching for something. Quote, he wondered what he was looking for. It had to be the woman, surely, proof of his crime, but to look for her in such a way as though she were no more than an item fallen from his pocket. And I'm thinking perhaps he's searching for the remains of his beloved sister who was killed on the crossing. Who knows? He watches the man, quote, lift individual stones, raise them above his head as though testing their weight. The man was preparing to kill him. Now this is what Samuel is thinking. At least, it could be. It could be the narrator or Samuel. It's just a single paragraph on its own saying, the man was preparing to kill him. It is very interesting whether this is the narrator or Samuel's thoughts, but I think they're Samuel's thoughts. The man is innocent, surely. Or am I being incredibly naive and ignoring all the facts that maybe I've missed something here? Samuel remembers a protest against the statue of the dictator. It seemed like there were a million people attending it, but it's actually only 2,000. And he has the opportunity to kill a soldier, the soldier again, but he doesn't take it. And I'm thinking, will he have the opportunity to kill the man, yet not go through with it? Or will that be the ultimate end of the novel? He will finally go through with it. I hope not. 
He encounters the man roughly cutting vegetables with some pride in his kitchen, but Samuel turns on him with a kitchen knife shouting, mine, mine, mine. In his head, he blames the man for leaving the front door open and for picking vegetables before they're ripe. And the man runs away. And I'm thinking, poor man, he was only trying to help out. Samuel now remembers after leaving prison being offered a job as a cleaner. But when he mentions he was in prison, the offer is immediately retracted. Quote, things are different now. There's no room for trouble, you see. We just want to live our lives. We don't need to start anything. Everything is good. And then we learn that he informed on Meria when he was in prison. Quote, Even though the statue was no longer there, Samuel did not wish to return to the site of his failure. If he had killed that soldier, he wondered, if he had had the courage to choke the man to the end, or to have picked up any of the weapons lying nearby, brought it down on his head, smashed him into unconsciousness, what might he have been then? A free man, perhaps? A man with a family? Someone better than a frightened informant who had given up the mother of his child to his interrogators? Someone who had a son to raise, grandchildren to play with? That was what Samuel asked himself as he walked the streets at night. What might he have been if he'd been braver, if he hadn't been afraid of murder? The man soon reappears at the front door and Samuel says, quote, You didn't have to run away like that. He continues, I'm an old man. Who have I ever hurt? And then we go back to see Maria now working on the docks as a prostitute. She doesn't seem interested that Leslie died. And she says, quote, It was a long time ago. I have other problems now. I can't carry that around with me too. Anyway, he was more your child than he was mine. It's better that he died. He'd never have become much of anything. And Samuel gives her all his money and moves on. And then the man discovers the hut where Samuel laid the body of the lady he found on the beach. There was a turtle shell in the hut when he laid her there and now that turtle shell is on the table. So the man puts his fingers to his lips and whispers, shh. And then we move into the fourth day. The key to the house is missing and Samuel thinks that the man wants to imprison him. The man is hammering stones, too many for one body, thinks Samuel. He wants to cover two bodies, one of which he presumes is his. As he approaches the man, knife outstretched, he lapses into his perceived, quote, weakness, that inability to kill. And Samuel then stumbles back to the house. He realises that the key wasn't stolen all along and that he may have fallen and not been pushed previously in the novel. Quote, Samuel had allowed paranoia to govern him, allowed himself to believe the man was a criminal without having any proof. But what had the man done that was so bad? Nothing. There was nothing that Samuel could conclusively say the man was guilty of. The narrator goes on, he should be more kind, he knew, but it was difficult releasing his pettiness. The resentments and paranoias he had cultivated over the past days, his mind a confusion of falsehoods and fear. And then the man fixes the video player and they watch a documentary together. Samuel remembers coming to the island and being shown the ropes by his predecessor, Joseph. Quote, Samuel had felt nothing more threatening than the sea and its relentless approach. He did not like the things it littered on the shore. The plants were easy enough to manage, the smother weed that choked everything easy to. It was the sea he wanted tamed. And then we have a beautiful description of crab catching as they come to mate on the shore. Quote, as he watched, Samuel found himself deep in the place from which the creatures had emerged, far down in the sunless reaches of the ocean floor, the submerged alien world from which they had made their way to the island for generations. Pushing past the rocks and kelp, the various flotsam and jetsam, moving their ponderous bodies steadily forward, a one-minded approach always to the same point, never altering over the centuries. Some of the crabs were very likely decades old. They were frightening, nightmarish in their size and power, but they were magnificent too, godlike with their mastery of time and sea and land. And he mentions their numbers are dwindling until ultimately they never return. Samuel imagines the man as his son, Leslie, grown into a man who will look after him, and it fills him with joy. And this suddenly turns to rage as he watches the man kill the red chicken when the other hens attack her. And in his anger, he kills the man, and the novel ends. Wow, what a turnaround of events in the last few pages. I think I need a strong drink. So there's some very interesting ideas that came out of this second half. The paranoia that Samuel has, that he's been tripped, that the man killed the lady, that the man wants to lock him up with the key to his house being missing, and that the man possibly wants to hide a second body. 
quote, Samuel had allowed paranoia to govern him, allowed himself to believe the man was a criminal without having any proof. But what had the man done that was so bad? Nothing. There was nothing that Samuel could conclusively say the man was guilty of. And shame, we've got this idea of shame. When he's looking at the statue, quote, even though the statue was no longer there, Samuel did not wish to return to the site of his failure. If he had killed that soldier, he wondered, if he had the courage to choke the man to the end or to have picked up any of the weapons lying nearby, brought it down on his head, smashed him into unconsciousness, what might he have been then? A free man, perhaps, a man with a family, someone better than a frightened informant who had given up the mother of his child to his interrogators, someone who had had a son to raise, grandchildren to play with. That was what Samuel asked himself as he walked the streets at night. What might he have been if he had been braver, if he hadn't been afraid of murder? And we also have this idea of owning land. The idea that you can really own land is an interesting one. Samuel gets agitated when he thinks he is going to lose the land. Quote, I'm telling you, I'm not giving the island to you. Put down the hammer. You can't have it. None of it is for you. It's an interesting idea, the idea that you can really own any land discuss. And then we've got the idea of weakness possibly being a strength. Ultimately, even though he doesn't realise it, he believes that his inability to kill that soldier was a weakness. But perhaps that was a strength. And we can see at the end of the novel, he decides to kill the man. Is that really perhaps a weakness? Perhaps he has now lost everything by killing that man, or maybe he has gained everything. Again, an interesting point of discussion there. Maybe he's fooled himself. Maybe everyone's saying that he's weak for not killing makes him think that, but actually it's it's a great strength of his. And we also have this idea of ecology. Those crabs are described with such beauty, but it's so sad that over time they stop returning. Let me just read you that section again. Quote, they moved in a ghastly fashion, their pale forearms waving, waving as they called on the females to mate. Some of the males had begun to duel, clenching hold of one another, dancing from side to side. Mounds grew where several climbed onto a female, forming a slow-moving, many-legged and terrifying monster. Already some of the females had begun to molt, crawling out of their shells, their softness grey in the night. Around them was the clack, clack, clack of fighting, the sound of limbs breaking, shells splintering. And he goes on, he had continued to catch them for 14 years, only ever taking his allotted one. But still the numbers began to dwindle. Fewer and fewer crabs were returning until one year they stopped coming altogether. So overall, I think this is just a fantastic book. It's an allegory. What does it mean to own something and then have it taken away without your power? You have two choices, perhaps, accept or retaliate. And in this scenario, unfortunately, Samuel did retaliate. What did you take away from the story? I would love to hear your thoughts. I'd like to talk a little bit now about next February's book, The Quiet American by Graham Greene, published in 1955. If you're reading alongside, I'll be reading up to part two, chapter four, on page 99. I've never read anything by Graham Greene before, and I don't know much about the author, but I'm looking forward to getting into his world. I'm going to read the first few pages, part one. After dinner, I sat and watched for Pyle in my room over the Rue de Catinat. He had said, I'll be with you at latest by ten, and when midnight struck, I couldn't stay quiet any longer and went down into the street. A lot of old women in black trousers squashed on the landing. It was February, and I suppose too hot for them in bed. One trishore driver pedalled slowly by towards the riverfront, and I could see lamps burning where they had disembarked the new American planes. There was no sign of Pyle anywhere in the long street. Of course, I told myself, he might have been detained for some reason at the American legation, but surely in that case he would have telephoned to the restaurant. He was very meticulous about small courtesies. I turned to go indoors when I saw a girl waiting in the next doorway. I couldn't see her face, only the white silk trousers and the long flowered robe, but I knew her for all that. She had so often waited for me to come home at just this place and hour. Fuang, I said, which means phoenix, but nothing nowadays is fabulous and nothing rises from its ashes. I knew before she had time to tell me that she was waiting for Pyle too. He isn't here. Je sais, je t'ai vu seul à la fenêtre. You may as well wait upstairs, I said. He'll be coming soon. I can't wait here. Better not. The police might pick you up. 
She followed me upstairs. I thought of several ironic and unpleasant jests I might make, but neither her English nor her French would have been good enough for her to understand the irony, and strange to say, I had no desire to hurt her or even to hurt myself. When we reached the landing, all the old women turned their heads, and as soon as we had passed, their voices rose and fell as though they were singing together. What are they talking about? They think I have come home. Inside my room, the tree I had set up weeks ago for the Chinese New Year had shed most of its yellow blossoms. They had fallen between the keys of my typewriter. I picked them out. Tu es trouble, Fuang said. It's unlike him. He's such a punctual man. I took off my tie and my shoes and lay down on the bed. Fuang lit the gas stove and began to boil the water for tea. It might have been six months ago. He says you're going away soon now, she said. Perhaps. He's very fond of you. Thank him for nothing, I said. I saw that she was doing her hair differently, allowing it to fall black and straight over her shoulders. I remember that Paul had once criticised the elaborate hairdressing which she thought became the daughter of a mandarin. I shut my eyes and she was again the same as she used to be. She was the hiss of steam, the clink of a cup. She was a certain hour of the night and the promise of rest. That's a very interesting opening. I like the fact that he immediately quotes the title in his very first paragraph. And when midnight struck, I couldn't stay quiet any longer and went down into the street. I'm very interested in finding out more about these characters, Phoenix and Pyle, and what they're doing in this place. Thanks very much for listening. If you have any questions or comments, I'd love to hear them. The email is bookshook at yahoo.com, or you can leave a comment on the Bookshook YouTube channel. And if you want to recommend a future book to read together, do let me know. I look forward to discussing the first part of The Quiet American by Graham Greene at the next episode of Bookshook on the second Friday of February, that's the 11th. See you then. (laughs) 